Hey there, welcome to LSAT Demon Daily. I'm Nathan Fox. I'm one of the founders of LSATdemon.com and uh, our weekly podcast, Thinking LSAT. With me is Lorena Hernandez Barcena. Uh, Lorena is one of our teachers at LSAT Demon. How did you come to us, Lorena? Yeah, so I started, you know, as a lot of students do on some of the other um, organizations that will not be named. Um, but Eventually, I found the podcast, and that made me realize, oh, there's a better way to do this. Um, at that point, I was kind of stagnating. I didn't feel like I was making progress. So um, I gave the demon a shot, and it made a big difference. Where did you start? Where did you end? Um, so I, my diagnostic was like a one high 150s, like a 156, maybe 158. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but I ended up with a perfect score. I got a 180. Wow. 150 something is a fine starting score. Well, that's one thing that people don't realize a lot. I bet you've been um, telling that to some of your students, huh? Yeah. That people sometimes are like, yeah, I did a cold diagnostic and I, I'm really embarrassed. It was so terrible. And it was like, it was 155. And yeah. Lorena, which is like, great. Yeah. Well, I went from there to a 180. So, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I try not to get caught up in the numbers too. I think that's an important point that we're just understanding more and more, but, um, definitely, um, I think that anyone can progress any amount, right? Like you don't have to have a diagnostic in the one sixties to end up with a no. perfect score, obviously. No, no, we, I mean, a, a diagnostic, uh, you know, a cold, like just sit down, no prep whatsoever, take your first practice test. The 150s is awesome. And yeah. even the 140s is like totally expectable, like that's totally expected, totally normal. And we see people go from the 140s into the 160s all the time, or the 140s, even sometimes into the 170s. Uh, that, yeah. that you're, you're not out of the game yeah. at all with Definitely. a diagnostic in the one forties, you know, one thirties starts to get a, but you're, you're probably facing a longer climb, uh, if you start in the one thirties yeah. or the one twenties, uh, but people, you know, yeah, most people are going to get a cold diagnostic in the one forties. Yeah. And yeah, we can help a lot from there. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I think actually the people for whom it comes a little bit more naturally, um, you know, it might be a little bit easier, but at the end of the day, it's a learned test for everyone. So, yeah, well, and there are people for whom it comes more naturally who are 0% cut out for law school. Yeah. I mean, I scored 170 something on my very first test. Okay. Like I, I didn't have the gains down, but I scored 170 something and I was the worst possible law student. I mean, I had no business in law school. So it's not your people misunderstand the purpose of a diagnostic. Yeah. The purpose of a diagnostic is to make some mistakes and then hopefully improve. And, yeah. you know, it's like you, you take a test so that you can make some mistakes so that you can start looking at those mistakes so that you can get better. Yeah. Yeah. People think like, oh, well, I can't take a practice test. I, I don't No, I, I'm going to study a bunch of theory first. And I, I'm, and then, and then, you know, like two months from now, I'll take a practice test. And Ben and I are like, no, rip off the bandaid. Like, just take a damn test. I don't care what you score. We can, we can help but you have to take that test so that we can see what you're struggling with so that we can start to help you. Yeah. If you endlessly study theory, that's not going to get you anywhere without knowing like practically what it is that you struggle with. So yeah. take a test, see where you're at, start asking questions, start digging in and figuring out why you're missing the ones you're missing. It's not the purpose of that diagnostic is not to like predict your entire future. It's just, yeah, yeah. it's just to see what you're struggling with. And yeah. we don't really know what you're struggling with. If you're not like doing a timed test and, you know, like you need to try to replicate it so that we can see where you're at. But somebody who starts in the one seventies, like me, 
your LSAT journey is going to be easy, but that does not mean that you're cut out for law school. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> someone who starts lower, you know, sure. Maybe your law school journey is going to, or your LSAT journey is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to take a little more time or, or, or require a little more effort but it definitely doesn't mean that you're not cut out for law school. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said for people who are willing to put in that time and effort. Oh. You know, law school is going to be more of that type of thing than things coming naturally. So a big part of the LSAT is just testing how hard you can work. And the reason why they're doing that is because in law school, you're going to work even harder than that. I don't care how hard you worked on the LSAT, you're going to work yeah. harder than that in law school. And you're going to work even harder than that as a lawyer. Yeah. And so like, yeah, sometimes people are like, oh, no, I, you know, I, I, I've, I studied for a month and I'm still only at 155. So I, I, you know, I, this is probably not the right thing for me. And I'm like, you're right because you you don't want to work hard enough and so right. that's fine like that's great you're but it's not because you're at 155 that this is not the right thing for you it's because you don't want to work hard enough that's why this is not the right thing for you yeah trust yeah. me i don't want to work hard either <laughs> that's why i should never have gone to law school in the first place right yeah 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 it's you know you need to be ready to like buckle up it's a long slog you know, and, and if the LSAT was easy for you, okay, great. You skipped like the preamble to how hard all of this is going to be. Like, just because the LSAT was easy doesn't mean that law school is going to be easy. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, as someone who has not yet started law school, the one of the things that is incredibly clear to me is that it's going to suck and you have to want it badly <laughs> enough that year it's worth you know getting yeah. through that so. yeah you know what's funny uh Lorena is that this this time of year um last year's crop of applicants are all starting you know they're all one yeah right sure now. and um one thing that I hear from them a lot in September <laughs> I get I get these texts from former students who are you know they're probably in law school for free if they listen to me, they're probably there paying zero dollars and they're happy about that, of course. But in September, they're popping off about, you know, I people always say how bad law school is. And it's it's just the, it, come on. It's, it's not that much. I already have all my reading done for the next three weeks in advance. And this is, you know, it's a piece of cake. That's what yeah. I hear from them in September. Mm -hmm. Then in October, I do not hear from them. <laughs> and I don't hear yeah, from right. them ever again until they graduate. Like, it's just like, they, they don't even realize how many hamster wheels it's like, it's not just one hamster wheel. You're going to yeah. end up with like a foot on one hamster wheel and a foot on another hamster wheel. And then you're trying to, with your hands, spin some other hamster wheels. And <laughs> you know, yeah. three years later you graduate. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess there's uh, something to be said for studying for the LSAT while you're doing something else for that oh, reason yeah. too, right? You, so we're practicing those muscles of doing something really hard and doing a full-time job or yep. work or school or whatever that is. So. Yep. I mean, and weirdly, if you study full-time for the LSAT, it's like not that productive. Yeah. Like the more you have going on, the more you're capable of doing. So yeah. frequently some of our most productive and successful LSAT students are like working full time and also doing a master's program at the same time and yeah. studying for the LSAT. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, when you only have a limited amount of time, every moment counts. So I, I feel like when I'm doing LSAT at this point, whether that's tutoring or previously the studying, you know, I'm, I'm really focusing because I have other stuff I should also be doing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Lorena, you've been talking a lot about stuff you actually know about. Uh, it is time to speculate on things that we don't actually know about. You ready? I love it. Yep. Okay. This is an email from anonymous. It says, Hey guys, I have an urgent question. Law schools are asking the date that I took the LSAT. 
accommodated mm. students take the LSAT later than normal LSAT takers. If I tell them the actual date I took the test, law schools may know that I was accommodated. What should I do? Am I overthinking this? Should I just tell them the date that most people took it, which is usually the Saturday or Sunday on the testing week? Yeah. Any advice for anonymous? What do you think about that idea? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I have also noticed that when I was filling out my applications, I had to go look up what day I took the test. Um, but that's a, a really interesting point that I had never thought about before. Um, yeah. I just feel like law schools have so much going on. I'm not confident that they're going to notice that the date itself is different. Unless they are specifically asking you that question for exactly that purpose. That's true. I mean, let me ask you this, Lorena. Why the hell else do they care? Yeah, I mean, that's only, it, it's a fair point because there are some applications that don't ask for the day and there's some that do. So if it was just standard practice, that would be one thing. I don't what does it tell, look like? What, yeah. what does the question look like on the app? Like, what does it actually say? And what's even the field look like? Where is it like a calendar where you're supposed to select the day or? What? They're, they're different. Um, so some, I believe there's at least one where you do have to select the day on like a calendar thing. Wow. There's another one that I believe <laughs> just says list the day and month. Um, and then there's another wow. that just asks you, like just has a spot, slot for the month and year. So uh, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I am not, uh, this is not in any way legal advice, but I am allowed to wildly speculate. Uh, I think that it is probably illegal for them to ask you that question. Mm. It just hasn't been like uh, adjudicated yet just go it is illegal for them to ask you whether you got accommodations yeah sure it is not illegal for them to ask you the dates that you took the LSAT but if someone sued them if someone like came in and said hey that's a, you're you're asking that question like you're you're forcing me to disclose information that you would not be allowed to ask me in another format. Yeah. If only accommodated students took the test on the day that I took the test, then if I disclose to you this date, then I'm disclosing to you that I was an accommodated student. Yes. What I will say though, and I'm only thinking about this because of the October debacle. I, I don't know what happens when you're, you have technical difficulties and you are reassigned to take the test on a different day. I don't know if that's always on a weekend or what. Um, if you can avoid saying the actual date, right? If it's not a calendar day, then I can't imagine that that is going to keep you out of law school. Saying yeah, if they're the allowed date. to answer, if they'll allow you to say August twenty twenty one, that's what that's my advice is to 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 just hide it by putting the month and year. Yeah. But if it's like a calendar thing and you have to actually pick a day, boy, if you are an accommodated student, uh, I don't know what to tell you. I, I don't yeah. think you should lie. Yes, I agree. Is it, it an is. optional question? Can you not answer the question? I don't think that it is an optional question. Wow. Um, we, we could be totally overthinking this. Schools could be asking, I mean, you know, I think a lot of times they don't even think it through. They just happen to put that on their form and yeah. they don't, they, they didn't really think about it, but I mean, they have information from LSAC. They get your whole report from LSAC. I know. They know how many times you took it. They know exactly what you scored on yeah. every administration of the test. The LSAC does not disclose to them though, if you were accommodated or not. And I can, you know, I hate to be so cynical, but there's a lot of money at stake. Yeah. And this does seem like there could be an incentive for schools to try to get you to disclose. I mean, we know for sure that they ask questions sometimes that sure seem like they are inviting you to disclose. I know that UCLA recently has been asking people, um, hey, 
I noticed that you improved a lot when you retook the LSAT. Want to talk about that? Yeah. Like asking the open-ended question. Oh, you want to talk about that? And I know applicants are really, really naive. And I have, I have seen applicants disclosing the fact that they were accommodated on their damn personal statement, which is a huge mistake. So the school's asking that open-ended question and you could easily go, oh yeah, well, I scored higher because you know I previously hadn't been accommodated for my ADHD, but then I got accommodations. And you think that like, they're gonna say, oh good, I'm glad you got those accommodations. Wow, that's great. And instead what they're really gonna do is go, oh, so your 172 is not really that reflective. It's actually the previous 162. That's more like your you know, ability. <laughs> Am I too cynical? Yeah, I I mean, I think if you are being as critical as possible, which admittedly is what we're being asked to do if we're trying to be lawyers, right? Yeah. Um, then there's definitely an argument for that. It's you should not have to disclose that information. I also think that they are trying to get through a huge, huge quantity of applications as quickly as possible. And if they really wanted to, they could make use of that information. I'm not confident how often that is actually occurring. No, we have no idea. We're in the realm yeah. of wild yeah. speculations. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, they also give full tuition scholarships for people with really good LSAT scores. They sometimes give more than full tuition scholarships to people with really good LSAT scores. That's a fact. You can, yeah. it's public data, go to ABA 509, any school you're looking at, and they probably give, for sure, they at least give half to full tuition scholarships to, and half to full can include full, by the way. So yeah. they, they for sure give half to full scholarships to some people. And yeah. that's a lot of money. And imagine if they had, two similarly situated applicants. Yeah. But they are able to find out that one of them happened to take the test on the day that the accommodated test takers took the test. And yeah. only gonna give a scholarship to one of them. I'm not saying they're actually doing that and I think it would be illegal for them to do so, but what's stopping them from doing that? Yeah, you make good points. And I mean, I think it's really complicated in this situation because you obviously, you can't lie. You just, you shouldn't, they're gonna know. Um, well, are they gonna know? I'm not sure if they're gonna know, but I don't think that you should lie. Um, but I think that getting around it when possible by just not giving the actual date. I would say uh, don't yeah. answer. If it's optional, don't answer. I mean, generally speaking, you don't have to answer optional questions. So if there's an optional question, that you don't think is favorable to you, don't answer it. If you do have to answer it, if it's mandatory, see if you can get around it by saying September, 2021, instead of September 13th, 2021. Yeah. And if you can't do that, then I think you have to answer honestly, but I also think that this question should not be asked. I don't, I don't think that yeah. they should be allowed to ask that question. I think that this is probably just something that hasn't actually come to light yet. This is the first time hearing about it. I mean, this email, which by the way, thank you anonymous for emailing this in, but that's the first that I've heard of it. Yeah. And it's potentially worrying. Yeah, anyway. uh, that's a good point, yep. If you want to chime in about this issue, uh, we would love to hear your thoughts. Just email daily at lsatdemon.com and uh, educate us. I am, I'm, I'm acknowledging. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm just randomly speculating in response to an email from a listener. So again, that's daily at lsatdemon.com and you can help us uh, sort this issue out. Thanks for listening.